Hi there, a warm welcome. Thanks for stopping by Bridging Minds again. And today we have an interview recorded in July 2024 with Zaren Aim. He's a Kabyle, um Algerian American writer and photographer and engineer by profession. And he discusses his experiences with ethnic profiling in the wake of uh, the 9 11 catastrophe, um, his interrogation by the FBI, and uh, the trauma it caused him and a bit of all his philosophy and writing and photography and some things about his life so he's a he's a great guy it was an absolute pleasure to converse with him my wife picked up his book in which he describes these things still moments a story about faded dreams and forbidden pictures uh in the um Algier airport uh she found in the Algier airport bookstore and uh, very thoughtfully thought about me and brought it and I loved the story so please stick around uh, the interview is about an hour and 30 minutes but I think it's quite worthwhile for you to stay and listen if you like it please hit the like button and feel free to share it with others and if you haven't already done so please hit subscribe and with that let's get going very good. Yes. Uh, nice meeting you, Kamal. It's nice to meet you. Uh, may, uh, so I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Zerin Aim? Zerin Aim, yes. Zerin Aim. Ah, great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, she, she is from Afron. So. Afron? An Afron. Yeah. Okay. I think I have a sister who who is uh, a mid, uh, she's a nurse in the area of Afron and Defla and so forth. She, she, she has been to Ain Afron, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And one of my brothers-in-law lives in Shifa. Shifa. Uh, you know, my wife's family. They they, they live through that region. That region. Okay. Around the Wilaya to Blida. So. Very good. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. I see you have a lot of books behind you. You must be a big yes. reader. I uh, I read a lot. I love reading. Very good. Yeah. Ever since I was a little boy. Yeah. So that's actually why my wife bought me your book because she knows I love reading. <laughs> and I want to read more more stories and accounts of people from Algeria. So, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, well, then we should uh, we should translate all the Algerian books into English. That would be wonderful. That would be yeah. wonderful. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe uh, we could find people who do that. <laughs> yes. Be... Yeah, definitely. Well, well, there is. I don't know. If, uh, are you familiar with Mulud Faraon? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, his uh, uh, his at least two or three books were translated uh, into English. Oh, yes. There is also there is also Mulud Mamri. The, the I don't know if you've heard of the Sleep Mamre, of the I, Just. Of, I, yes, I I've heard of him. The Sleep of the Just has been translated in 1953. Okay. Yeah, the Sleep of the Just. Very interesting because you know, uh, it's uh, he writes about the the Algerian War and how. There was this community, you know, even though Algerians did participate in the, you know, in the World War II, but when they go into the barracks, they, they are not the same. They are treated differently, just like the African-Americans who went to war. <laughs> yes, you know? that was my, my father's, my, my, grand, my grandfather's experience, my grandfather's experience in World War II. Uh, he was stationed in France. He was actually in North Africa, but, was he? He, was, but he wasn't a combatant. And I, I think... I think it was Morocco, uh, okay. but, you know, because African Americans they um, most were not allowed to be combatants, so they play support roles. They're cooks. Are mm -hmm. okay. So my grandfather was in in uh, somewhere in North Africa, I think Morocco, and then in okay. France, and um, you know, then to the UK, and then back to France. But you know, then. You arrive back in America, and you know you, you have problems. So yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Very so you mentioned. I, I think you you mentioned a uh, Camus. Albert Camus. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I remember when I was in high school. I just remembered we had to read a book called The Plague. Yeah, yeah. It was set in Algeria. It was, yeah, you know, in Oran, exactly in Oran. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm starting to remember it. Was, I read it a long time ago. But, um... yeah. but, but, but you should read the, 
you know, the first uh, sleep of the just. Sleep of the just. Yeah, it's really uh, translated from French by, you know, it was written by an Algerian author, translated in 1950, 1950s. It's very, very early, you know, right. into English. It's available, you know, online and I think somewhere in the U.S. You know, many, many library books have copies. Great. I, I will look for it. The Sleep of the Just. Mm -hmm. I will definitely look for it. So, so thank mm -hmm. you so much for thank you for so much for your time. Thank you for joining me. Um, well, thank you. So. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so you're because you're traveling. Uh, so you return on the on the seventh. Yeah, tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm returning to Romania because uh -huh. I I had to come for to get some documents from my daughter. So okay. I came on Sunday. I'm going back on Saturday. Then I will go back to Algeria on the eleventh from Romania, and then we'll be back here on August fourth in the U.S. Great, great, great. Well, a, a little bit about my my channel. It's uh, called Bridging Minds, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm I'm just starting it. I have a few interviews, but I want to have conversations with people, especially writers and thinkers, but eventually multiple people, uh, different walks of life. You know, especially people who have interesting stories to try to bridge make connections because I, I believe the stories are very important um, to connecting people to ideas and helping people expand their minds and expand their horizons. So it's, um, it, I mean, I like the, I like the title of bringing minds, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. yeah I, I, I hope it's something that I'm actually able to help do. So, that, well, that's so, um, yeah, so so about your book, Still Moments, a yes. story of faded dreams and forbidden pictures. Um, my wife picked it up for me, and, and I really enjoyed your story. But you know, when I read it, I realized it's all is basically all concerns. It, it, all, it all centers around your interview with the FBI and what Correct. leads up to it. And actually, I think it would be a good movie. I think it would make a, a good biopic film. But uh, I think one of the, if I may, one of the reviewers mentioned this is like, you know, a suspense story at the beginning. It it is, it is. You know, yeah. when the first couple of shots, there is this sense of suspense. You know, you 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 describe how you're driving along Route sixty six, which um. Which is one of these, you know, one of those great scenic American routes uh, that I've always wanted to drive it someday. My grandmother used to drive along Route 66 quite a bit um, back in the old days, and you know, so she was a model when she was young, oh, so, okay. which was kind of interesting. But um, you know, you're there and you see a couple of barns. And you start to take photos. So, you know, if, if I so if I could ask, so you are a photographer. You're a professional photographer, and you, so photography is your art. If you could share with the people watching yeah. the interview, you know, a little bit about your background, your life, uh, how you came to America, how you uh, developed a love of photography, and um, you know, yeah. led you to that day on uh, October 18th, 2002, right? 2000, 2002, yes. Okay, yeah. great, great. It is. So um, I'm not a professional photographer, so let's go back. Okay, yes. I, I, I was born in Algeria in 1957. At that time, in, my, you know, in a small village in the mountains near the Jojura Mountains, at that time, nobody in my in our you know primary school went, went beyond primary school. We all became shepherds. But since Algeria had just got an independence, and we had a school teacher who said, "Hey, why don't you take the exam to go to junior high school?" Mm -hmm. And I was one of the first generation to go uh, from the primary school in our village to a junior high school, then a technical high school because I was. Kind of nice grades in in 
in you know in math and calculus. Uh, then in 1977, uh, Algeria was trying to get a lot of engineers trained and formed. So they sent a lot of the, you know, those uh, people from high schools to different countries to get educated. Russia, England, Romania, and uh, Canada. And in 1977, I was, I was given a scholarship to come to the U.S. to become an engineer. So I'm really... And a professional engineer, not a professional photographer. And uh, I did my my undergraduate in New Orleans, which you may be familiar with. Yes, my brother, my youngest brother lives in New Orleans, actually. I, I really enjoyed it. And my, my photography, really, my interest in photography just happened in, when I was uh, in you know uh, doing English classes in Texas. I bought a a Canon TX camera for two hundred dollars. <laughs> Not a lot of money. <laughs> and so I kept taking pictures. And then one friend said, Rabbi, don't take pictures in in black in negative. Take pictures in slides." I had never heard of slides before. So I so I did take pictures. You know, whenever I traveled back to Algeria, when I returned to Algeria in 1982 after I got my uh, my engineering degree. I, I took another camera with me and they worked in the desert for six years mm -hmm. uh, with my, the national oil company, Sonatrack. That's the, uh, national, uh, the national, oil co uh, national oil and gas company of Algeria. So, and uh, since I worked in the desert, everyone didn't work in the desert. I got to work six weeks in the desert and three weeks off. So when I would come up north where I lived, with three weeks off, there was nothing else to do but take pictures. So I kept, mm. you know, traveling around, taking pictures of houses, of interior, you know, uh, the interior of houses, sceneries, uh, festivals. And when I came, though, so then after finishing my contract with the National Oil Company, I decided to come back to the U.S. for graduate school on my own this time. So I didn't have to sign a contract with the Algerian government or with a national national oil company. So I came back and I brought a lot of my slides that I took in Algeria to show to show people what Algeria is like. And uh, it just happened that one day, so I was on, uh, admitted for a PhD uh, a PhD program in mechanical engineering in New Orleans, Tulane University. If you are familiar with, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So and then one day, it's just by, by just by luck, I was showing my slides to a friend, and he said, "Raba, this is uh, your slides are interesting. Why don't you tell your story about living in Algeria, about you know your background, the Berber background?" So I decided to write my story, and I sent it to uh, one magazine, the World and I magazine, which doesn't exist anymore; <laughs> it's closed. Yeah. And they published my story with pictures. And then I wrote a second article about decorations of uh, Berber houses. And it was also accepted. And so I kept taking pictures since then and so forth. So when I moved, when I got my PhD in, and graduated and came to Chicago, I mean, to Illinois to work for Caterpillar, I decided, you know, I would go around and still take pictures. And that's when... I was just taking that day, October 18th, 2002, taking pictures of, of railroad tracks, you know, barns, corn barns, and so, and, you know, on Route 66. And that's mm -hmm. what led to it, you know. So in, so in summary, I'm not, I mean, I have published pictures in magazines, uh, in, in uh, cover books. My, my pictures were used, but I'm not like fully working as a professional night and day as a professional photographer. Okay. I'm do it on the hobby side, but I'm not really. My life is not. Really, but I still love photography. So you would say you're you're more of an artist, then your 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 photography is is yes, is yeah, a passion correct, yeah. and it's an artistic. Yeah, and uh, and also writing. I also like stories, articles, uh, political articles sometimes. So I've used that name uh, mm -hmm. for you know for writing articles about Algerian politics. American politics sometimes, right. and uh, so that's what led me to this, you know, the artsy world in a way. Right. 
So, so you are Amazeri. Uh, uh, a Berber, yeah, Amazir, yeah. yeah. I mean, my 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 mother never spoke. I mean, we speak uh, Berber at home with my mother, so I grew I grew up Berber. Yeah, I speak Berber, and Arabic, then French and English. I'm learning Spanish. <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful language. I, I know you. a little bit of Spanish. Where yeah. I used to know a lot more, but I like it. And you know, it, it, Spanish has a connection with the oh, yeah. broader North Africa. Uh, yes, yeah. definitely, definitely. So uh, it's so the the part of Algeria you're from you're, it's basically Kabylia, the, the region uh, close yeah, to it. It's Kabylie, Kabylie in Kabylia. in a, uh, Kabylia in in a, yeah it's K A B Y L I A Kabylia. Hmm. It's spelled Kabylia, yeah. So uh, there is yeah. So Kabylia is like not west of uh, it's west of Algiers in mountainous region next to Algiers and next to Jujura Mountains. You, if you if you go to my website, I have pictures of the Jujura Mountains. If you go to my website, I have a lot of pictures there that I that I, that I put in there. I saw some of them. I I, I, yeah. I when I was googling, yeah. and I arrived at your website. I looked at some. It's very beautiful. Terry, I, I want to visit someday. You know? Well, you are welcome to visit. You know, just just you know, just stop. when I am there. Just you know, I mean, we're in contact now. Just say, hey, I'd like to visit you. The mountains of Jujula, you will come. If you like hiking, well, look, I have a group of people with whom I do hiking in the in mountains also. Ah, I love hiking. Hiking is Good. wonderful. So, so you know, um, so your your photographic expression, you you see things of beauty or things that catch your eye, um, and would you say you try to capture a story or narrative? Yeah. So I mean, whenever I see either, you know, expressions on people, it could be you know just even pieces of material, pieces of machinery mm -hmm. uh, that has a certain pattern. I like to take pictures of insects sometimes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, also uh, flowers. Mm. Uh, patterns, you know, anything that really that uh, draws my eyes, like oh, this is beautiful. Then I take a picture of it, and I know with time that picture cannot be taken again. Yeah, you know, yeah because think, yeah, because the you know flower will die, or you know the the, the church will get old, and then nobody is going to you know uh, remodel it. Houses will break. I have like uh, pictures of a Berber house in my village. Now it's all torn down mm -hmm. because the people died and nobody maintained it. So it's really not there anymore. So how can we tell people about the old days when you have no pictures for them to visualize what you know to visualize what you saw? So I like to take pictures of things that may disappear one day from from nature, from our world, from our environment. Hmm. It, could be, a, mm -hmm. it could be faces i've taken picture of family members i don't show that i don't show them the pictures right away but i show them to them 10 years later <laughs> and it's last oh wow what a nice picture thank you for taking a picture of that and also sometimes i took uh there was recently uh i took a picture in 1984 of my mother and this woman uh doing uh, uh working with wool 1984 so it looked like 40 years ago so this lady the you know the, the woman's daughter contacted me and she told me are you the person who took pictures in our house i said yes i remember do you have any pictures of my mother because I lost all my pictures, the pictures of my mother. So I looked in my file, I found one, because this was the only time where she accepted to be in that picture, and I sent it to her. That's beautiful. So yeah. she was so happy, she thanked me so much, you know? So mm -hmm. pictures really do uh, have a lot of value with mm -hmm. time. You know, if we don't take them, then you kind of, you will forget what happened in the past. So I like to take pictures of people, nature, scenery, 
Uh, I have pictures of my in, in the village where there were no houses on hills next to our village. There are no houses, and now there are houses in that in that hill. Wow. So if, if you know, if you when I show that picture to people, like really, before there were no houses here. I said yes, before there were no houses in this place. So that's you the idea. Really. Something that, that you capture something that can never again be captured. You captured the correct? Yeah, that's which is amazing. You know, there's. Yeah, and also, a, I, I don't have problems taking pictures of people. I just say, can I take a picture of you? And most of the people will say yes. You know, I have a, a recently also a, a, a girl who came to the U.S. contacted me. She is the daughter of a neighbor. And I was able to trace back her grandmother's picture and give it to her. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It looks so like you you it, it, it's a way of preserving history and but in and stories and moments in time that will never occur again. Yeah, culture also because like people how people dress before and how they dress now is different. Uh, so the dresses of our you know Berber women in the villages are different. You know people don't wear the, the you know the the the, the full out. Or the headscarf, the the way it is, you know, young people just like let their hair. So it's like a way to show what it was before, you know. Hmm. Yeah. And without I mean, that, you know, no one could without that. Right. Yeah. You know, like no one could visualize that if you without pictures, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I think that's amazing. I, I love photographs. I, I think photography is an amazing. Are you know painting, drawing? There's many different kinds of um of expressive arts, but there's something about you know a photograph isn't just mechanical. You know, it's there's an eye. You choose a subject. You capture a mood. There's there's so much into it. But sometimes when people look at photographs, they 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 get a feeling, but they don't think of the process. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to. I mean, also sometimes you, uh, even if you just take the picture without even thinking about the angle, the composition, just capturing, uh, you know, a nice moment of people doing something is is good enough, you know. But you, of course, you can, you know, the angle, the, the the lighting, you know, depth of field and so forth. But sometimes you don't need all that, you know, because you can, especially when it comes to faces, you know. So it's really, uh, you know, just. A, Capturing the moment of a smile, or you know, a small cry for a baby, is is very beautiful. Mm. There's um in my wife's town, Afrun. There's a, an old hammam, this bathhouse that must be over a hundred years old, and it's falling to disrepair. It's in ruins. It's it's not actively used anymore. I think they people moved in and they use it as apartments. But is slowly collapsing, slowly falling apart. But you can still see um, the let and the the writing. You know, there's the there's the old style of Maghrebi, yeah. uh, taught, and then there's a you know newer style of, of Arabic letters. But the older style, um, it's the, the you know the, there's letters there. It's the hammam. I can't remember the name of it. I have to ask my wife. But it's molded into like the plaster over. The plaster, it. Yeah, yeah. You can see it falling apart and the, you know the, the mm. stones inside. But I kept having an urge to take a photo because it was it was something that had a historical presence in the lives of so many people. And yeah. slowly falling apart in five years from now, ten years from now. Nobody will, nobody will remember. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so even yes, speaking about writing. Uh, I was recently, I was in Spain, in, in Granada. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, Arabic writing on the walls. And I took pictures, because it's so beautiful, I took pictures of it. I went to also to uh, Alcala, the, the NRS, north of Spain, and they have a church. But if you go to this church inside, it's the remain of a mosque. And you can see you know, Arabic lettering inside also. So it's really, you know, and, and I took pictures of those because, hey, this is reality. Yeah, it's, uh, 
you know, and, and imagine if um if a hundred years from now, you know, something happens, if it's demolished, or this some cultural change and the you know the Spanish government gets rid of it, or you know, who knows what will happen. You know, at least those pictures are there and so many countless other pictures about that history. Yeah. So it, I'm sorry, just one moment. Uh, that was my uh, brother-in-law calling my my wife, I guess. Um, so, uh, so your love for photographs led you got me in trouble. Pardon? <laughs> my love photograph got me in trouble. <laughs> yes. Sometimes love gets people in trouble. It gets us all in trouble sometimes. Yes. So, but um, you know, it's interesting how a small decision might change the course of someone's life and we never know what will happen after the smallest moments so there you were on october 18th uh 2002 and you're driving along route 66 whereabouts was this along the route do you recall it's between pontiac and bloomington oh okay yeah okay. so i live in bloomington i used to work in pontiac so instead of going, of going on the I-55, which is the, mm -hmm. you know, the interstate, sometimes I decide to get off the interstate. It's too fast <laughs> for me. Right. You don't see things. So mm -hmm. I like to drive on Route 66, you know, for fun. Take you, you know, there are less less traffic. You can stop by little towns, have a cup of coffee. Uh, one day, I don't know if you remember in the book, I I, I saw some spider webs. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, of course, in, you know, I was coming back at night, 4 p.m. But the next weekend, I went back and I took a lot of pictures of spider webs on Route 66. And it was interesting. And I do mention that in the book, how what I learned about sp spider webs, how they build their, their, their webs and what do they do if they hear a noise. Yeah. So that's very, very interesting. It is. It, it is. You know, I, I've always been entranced by by spiders. I love and you have some amazing photographs. Um, yes. Just of the of the webs, the spider. Yeah. And... Do you see how crazy I am taking pictures of spider webs? <laughs> I spent, I think that day spent like close to an hour taking pictures of spider webs. <laughs> you know, but those are little moments. Into I mean, this is you have these intricate amazing structures and mm -hmm. you know this the wind will blow and it'll be gone forever and trillions of spiders all around the world are making these things but your eye you caught you saw it and you you recorded that and you know yes. those are moments that will never exist again and so the the um the barns and the sheds so the yeah. pictures, yeah. There's a certain um, a, a certain simplicity to it. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. And it's almost as if the buildings have their own personalities, and you're able to you're able to 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 capture it. Or maybe capture is not the right word. Maybe there's a better choice of words. But um, it was still recorded. But can uh, I hold that... a second? I have somebody at the door. I wasn't expecting. Oh, no problem. No problem. I am on an interview, so because you are used to doing it, I want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, no problem at all. No, no problem. So, um, so you're able to get these amazing photos, but then uh things changed if you wouldn't mind sharing um what, what yeah happened. so i was so i was i was at that moment i was you know crouching down to take picture of the parallel lines 
of the railroad tracks. And it just happened, I was looking and, you know, so parallel, the railroad tracks are parallel mm. to Route 66. So I could see my viewfinder, a car coming, and I noticed it. I said, this is the state trooper. I, and they, in fact, in the picture, you can see it. These, I don't know, one of the pictures has a state trooper in it. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I don't know if you noticed that. Oh. The picture is a state trooper in there. If you look at the picture I put, oh, published. Yes. Yes, uh, this one right there. Yeah, I knew it was him. So he stopped, you know, so he's, I knew this guy is coming after me. So what mm. I think what happened, and I mentioned in the book, somebody must have you know, seen me going around there taking pictures mm -hmm. of of the, the bands and reported me, you know, hey, this is, this is uh, why is there somebody here in Rochester sick taking pictures? Mm. So then I, I, I did get up and I waited for him. And, you know, he approached me and the first thing he asked me was kind of little interesting. Where are you from? You know, <laughs> I think. Strange question. Uh, I think he said, well, well, I mean, what are you doing here? I said, oh, yeah, I said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm doing, taking pictures. Why? He said, for my hobby. And then he said, where are you from? So I guess he did, you know, saw my skin, you know, brown skinned person taking pictures in central Illinois. You know, that's not uh, very common. <laughs> yeah. And I said, well, it, instead of saying, you know, I didn't want to say I'm from Algeria, not that I am ashamed of being Algerian, but, you know, hey, I, I live in Bloomington. That's where my house is. <laughs> that's what I meant. You know, I'm from Bloomington. Well, where, you know, I'm, even if I told him I'm from Algeria, he may, he may not know. Where Algeria is, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just said I'm from Bloomington. You know, I told him I'm from here, and he said, "Where is here?" I said, "From Bloomington." Then he asked me, "What do I do and where do I work?" I answered those questions. Then he asked for my ID, and so I gave him my ID, and he went back to his car to do a background check. You know, at that moment, I didn't really like, didn't feel very good. I went to my car. Yes, you know, I went back to my, entered, uh, in, I went inside the car and I took notes. I was taking notes of what he said. As you know, when you, all the questions, and mm -hmm. then he came back. I think when he came back, I didn't even, I didn't even see he was back when I, because I was writing. Then I looked up, oh, he's back, you know. Then mm -hmm. he said, uh, you know, keep, keep taking pictures. But I didn't feel like taking pictures anymore. You know, because yeah, I mean, when somebody gets into your into your area of thinking and work, like you lose you lose interest. Mm. So then I just went home. I didn't even I went home and like okay, nothing will happen until uh, well, was it until this? I think three months later when the FBI called me. Mm. Be January. The first, January, yeah, January. Yeah, for like three or four months, yeah. Uh, and when he called, it was interesting. It was the second time he called. Hmm. The first time he left the message, I didn't think it was a serious message, so I just ignored it. Mm -hmm. And then on, on January, then I took the phone and the rest is in the book. Right, right. Unless you would like to me to expand on some something else, you know. No, I would definitely like for everyone watching this to to, to get the book. Definitely get the book. And, you know, it's it's um, there is a bit of suspense at the beginning, and I like I like memoirs. I like uh, you know I like stories of people, you know, especially if it describes their in their interior reality, which is which is one of the neat things about your book. I really like, you know, it, it reflects what you're thinking, how you're straight thinking. But it's not stream of consciousness. It's almost like reading a novel. It's almost like Thank reading you. the story as it goes through. So, I mean, definitely if, you know, I would think that anyone watching us should definitely read the book. But, um, you know, in, in short, maybe it's... Um, so from the story you tell, this led up to an interview with the FBI on January 31st. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but because you know after he called me, 
Well, what surprised me is that he, they wanted to come to my house and talk to me in my house. And that I could not accept. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have learned a few things, uh, but America, you don't, you know, you don't let, uh, you know, a person without any warrant to your house, no matter what, you know. Mm. So I, I, so back and forth, I even I asked him, can we come, can I come and meet you in a coffee shop? You know, can I come to your office? And he said, no, 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 we'd like to come to your house. That made me, you know, think, why does he want to come to my house? What is there in my house? It's, you know, I, I'm doing photography outside. Why do they need to come to my house? You know? So I, 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 I didn't like that idea of the, the intrusion into my private, you know, my private life. Uh, and also even, let's say, my, my children are home, the FBI is home, or my neighbors see the FBI is there. Yeah. Right. So I didn't like the idea. So back and forth, you know, I, I refused. I said, no, no, I don't want you to come to my house. Several times I told him that. <laughs> I said, can I, you know? So then I told him, well, you give me your phone number and I'll contact my lawyer. We'll contact you about, you know, what, what to do about this. But then I never had, you know, after living so many years in the U.S., I never had you know, need for a lawyer, <laughs> no traffic tickets, you know, no accidents. I didn't kill anybody. I didn't, you know, rob a bank. <laughs> I, 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 know I, have, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I haven't sold drugs, you know. Uh, so I didn't, so it was, I needed a lawyer, but how, in, before I, before I did that, I did contact the, uh, the ACLU branch here in Bloomington. But they didn't have anybody available. And uh, here, they told, well, if you want to wait until, you know, two weeks or a month from now, we're going to have somebody from Chicago, you know, help you out during the interview. But they said, if you want, you know, if you, if you cannot wait, because I didn't want to wait any longer, you know, like I don't want to wait a month being still a suspect of the FBI. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, so I decided, yeah. So then the, the ACLU uh, the re representative told me, that if you go and meet them, don't ever meet without a lawyer. Right. Which is good have, advice. Yeah. Yeah. It was good advice. Okay. If you, I, I told him, I can, I told the you know, ACLU, I told them, you know, I cannot wait a month. He said, well, hire a lawyer, but don't go without a lawyer to talk to them. You have to have a lawyer. You know? Mm -hmm. So then my wife uh, is a dental assistant, so she, she, her boss is from the, you know, Bloomington. He has some contacts here. So he gave me a, a referral to one of his, uh, to one of his friends who is a lawyer. Mm -hmm. The only thing I, when I went and talked to him, he wanted to see my, to see my work. It's like I had to, you know, to prove myself to the lawyer, which I didn't really like. Hmm. Because you know, but then he said, "Okay, show me what you have." So I, I thought maybe he was working for the FBI also. <laughs> right. You know, the whole that period of time right after September 11th, it's um things things changed. They really oh, yeah. did in, a, in some very strange ways, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So then I, I you know I showed up at his office with my wife. With my, you know, my published book, with my published articles, uh, with pictures and so forth, and he said, "Okay, let me call them." You know, so he set up an interview with them, mm. and that's when we went in at nine o'clock uh, to meet with them in in, in normal behind the Walmart. <laughs> that's where their office was. <laughs> of all the strangest places, the FBI behind a Walmart. Yeah, small office behind Walmart. So, um, if you could describe how how the interview went, but also, you know, how you felt um, through the process, uh, how interacting with them, yeah, what you found strange, you know, and and and, and how you well, first how you what, processed it. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been. It's been like more than 15, close to 15 years and even more than that now. But it was kind of, you know, very simple office, 
there was a picture of Hoover, I think I mentioned in the book also, <laughs> David Hoover there, and because as you know, when I looked around, there was a small cabinet, there was uh, two chairs, there were two, there was a supervisor and the FBI uh, uh, agent who interviewed me. And so I had my two, I had my lawyer and his assistant with me. And then the question started, you know, about my name and what do I do? And uh, also, what were you, you know, uh, all the, what were you doing? Why do you do that? They ask me questions like, what's your name of your wife, the name of your parents, you know, it's like, what, the, what is this? <laughs> and then they ask me one question. I refused to answer. There was no way I could answer it, you know. Mm. And the most surprising so the, and I'm sure you 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 read the book and you know which question I'm mm. talking about. So, but I let the, the readers find out. But there was one question which was like so stupid, you know, it's like, are you a terrorist? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's really crazy. But I, I felt, you know, I really didn't feel very good when I got out of the interview there. I was really sad, very sad, very disappointed, you know, that you, that because of the, a, a person's skin color, they judged us as a terrorist, you know. They, I could not be any other thing but a terrorist. A brown person taking pictures in America is suspect. Why? <laughs> Why? And, you even, know... and, even, and even the my lawyer, I remember, he asked him, if it was a Swedish person taking a picture, and the oh, and the FBI agent said, yeah, if it was a Swedish person, there would have been no problem. He even acknowledged that. It's like, what is this? It's um, it's disappointing. It, it is a disappointing thing. That so this I, I, I felt America. I felt his questions were like. Like something, you know, getting into my body and killing, killing my humanity, because yeah. to be thought as a mm. terrorist, which means I'm not human anymore. Because you terrorists know? are dehumanized, you know. If, yeah. If so I, I was. Yeah. So his questions were dehumanizing me, mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, you know, very terrible to feel dehumanized. Yes, it is. It is. So I, I felt I was, and I, I think I mentioned that in the book. After, you know, after the interview, I really lost interest in photography for a while. I didn't even mention the, what what happened to my wife. You know, like I, you know, I, I wanted to forget the the dehumanization process I went through. And for three months, I I couldn't really, uh, you know, think, you know, think. I, yeah, I, I didn't, I, I didn't like it. I didn't like my life. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's the reason. After a while, I said, I have to resolve this problem. I have, you know, I have to, you know, I have to give hope to myself. I have to, you know, f not forget. I mean. You know, try to put that behind me, and that's the reason I started to write my book three months later. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't start writing right away. It took me like three or four, I think until April or May, that I started to think about, you know, writing all my emotions to get them out. Really, I think, you know, it's it sounds as if. The experience itself was a trauma, so it, it, it would make sense. You had something you loved; it was a hobby, something you enjoyed, and this this spoiled it. It kind of ruined it for a while. Yeah, correct. And also, after a while, it's like, I mean, I was afraid to lift the camera again <laughs> and take pictures. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, wait a minute, you know. So I had to fight that. You know, I had to fight the. You know the fear of lifting the camera and getting again dehumanized. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a you know some there's a theory, um, there's a psychological theory about how uh, emotions and experiences can be embodied. So it's not just something in the mind, but you somatically feel it. 
So some, you know, something changes and the way you actually physically feel in doing something or engaging in something, it changes, you know? Uh, I also th then start to, to, to wonder when people see me in the street, what do they think, <laughs> even without the camera? Right. Like, yeah. okay, if this guy, if the FBI or any other government official you see, you know, sees a, brown, a suspect in a brown person taking a camera, what do citizens, you know, regular citizens see when they see a brown tall person like me? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's mm -hmm. like you wonder when the, uh, when people see black men in the street, right? The same thing, right? They, they, yeah, it's the same same thing, really. Right. I mean, it's it, it's parallel, you know. There is. They see a tourist, you know. They, if you see a black man, they see, uh, you know, a, a person who has no, you know, right. whatever, no, you know, the drug dealer or something, right? Yeah, they assume they assume make assumptions on what on the people on the person's skin. It's like there's a stereotype view. There's a there's a box. They put yeah. you in this box based on how you appear. They put someone exactly. else in this box based on how they appear, and. Yeah. There's no complex humanity there. There's just something very simple. This person is a terrorist. This person is a drug dealer. This person is a criminal. Yeah. So there's this or that. Simplifying, simplifying the skin color, you know, which is kind of terrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so even when I go shopping, like, okay, that person smiled at me. I'm not sure it's a smile. You know, they're just putting up a front. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe it's a smile, a fear, like, what do I do? This person. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So how long was I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, unfortunately, you know, mm -hmm. this could happen and this happens. You know. Yeah. It is unfortunate. How long was it after that before you began to feel a desire to um, to re-engage in photography? I think at least it was at least uh, Easily a year or two before I start to take pictures, really, very easy. and I would just take, make sure, you know, not to take them in in places where I would be suspected of terrorism, <laughs> like bridges. You know, you don't want to take a, a pictures of a bridge. <laughs> uh, so those are the things I, you know, I try to try to avoid. You know, in fact, I told, uh, I think I told the FBI, hey, can you give me a pass now? I'm okay. To take pictures of anything, and he says, "No, we cannot do that." Yeah, photographer pass. Yeah. yeah. You know, I had a experience. It's not the same. It's it's not even parallel. But uh, when um, I was in Algiers, I trying. I think it was which train station was it near? I think it was near Aga. Oh and, yeah. Okay. No Aga. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, a naive. American guy, you know, this is my first time. In, no, this is my second time in Algeria. And um, I'm walking with my wife. And I just, you know, I have a cheap little mobile phone cam. Uh, I think it was like 10 megapixels. But, you know, I was just trying, I was trying to capture the feelings of this place, what it was like, you know, things I could remember. And the train station was very, it reminded me of, um, movies and pictures of old fashioned American train station. Mm. Actually if, I'm sorry if you'll excuse me. The because of the fourth of July, you know, oh by the way, um the fifth. Today is the, the fifth Friday. Oh and even in Algeria. <laughs> yes, yes. So for we Americans it's the fourth for you Algerians is the fifth. Yes. So uh, yes, exactly. congratulations on your independent on your independence. Yeah, I mean a lot of uh, a lot of people you know, may not view Algeria independence, but it brought, it brought a lot of changes to Algeria. The independence from France uh, really brought a lot of good changes to Algeria. It's good. One of them is education. Uh, in, I think in my book also, you know, be, during the French French occupation, 88% well, of Algerian men were uneducated, hmm. illiterate, illiterate, you know. Yeah. Now, close to 90 or 94% of women were uneducated, you know, illiterate. 
This and is... now we have PhDs and doctors and engineers and so forth. So it's really uh, independence was fought, you know, for a good reason, really. There's locally an, an Alger, for example, an Algerian doctor. Um, my wife was was showing me an article, and it, it's you know, you, you, someone sees someone from their land, their culture, who who who's made it, who's done a good job. You know, many people, you know, people have this experience, you know, like a, a Latino or an African-American sees someone from their demographic, from our demographic, who makes it. And, you know, this is pride. So my wife showed me this article of, 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 of a very um, a respected Algerian doctor who just started working locally uh, for the University of Cincinnati. And it's like, you know, or you have... Um, scientists engineers you know and i and i see these um even some algerian groups on on uh, facebook and i just just read you know as a third party looking in you know to better understand the world right. and you know i i see these articles and, and the the pride that people have you know that, you know someone they became educated then they, you know, they, they got their PhD and now they're making a change in the world. And mm. It's a beautiful thing. And the reason, if I may, the reason is because for many years during the French occupation for 100 years, we had nobody, I mean, a few, only a few people educated, you know? And so to see today, you know, in, in my family, we have lawyers, we have, you know, pharmacists, we have engineers, you know, the, you know, even in the US here, we have so many PhDs, Oh, we are not as, as savages or or you know as before. You know that's the whole thing. You know it gives you it gives you you know uh, the, you believe, start believing. Oh, we can do this thing in life. You know it gives hope to future generation. They can go up. You know go in the sky. They can go be astronauts. They can give them hope to become something. You know instead of just you know working in the fields and uh, yeah i mean all the working in the fields is not, there's nothing wrong with it <laughs> mm -hmm. being a farmer and so forth but to give hope to the next generation is important it is important my grandmother well my paternal grandmother no she she was a she would tell me stories about how as a poor african american girl in the south in georgia you know she, her family were sharecroppers so they would mm -hmm. she would pick cotton along with um with her with her cousin uh, Rosemary uh, and they're both wonderful old women they they both passed away um, a couple of years ago but you know they would they would pick cotton barefoot but unlike the other uh, just little girls nine ten years old the whole family was out and they had to pick cotton but both my grandmother and Rosemary they wanted to be educated so they would as you know they would run to the run for the fields they had to go miles and miles and miles to the school and barefoot no shoes just so that they could learn and they would have to come back to help their family in the fields and you know they um there there's this respect for education in my family you know my great grandfather uh, instilled and the same on my maternal side you know, you you had people who, they they were they, they may someone may have been illiterate and poor, and felt you know oppressed by the by the system by the dominant society, but had a drive to to work hard to become educated to learn to learn how to read, you know that's something you know, in the case of Algeria, or other French colonial. Uh, situations I've read about. Yeah, it, it seems almost as if the colonial regime, as part of the oppression of the people, would prevent them from being educated. Would, would oh yeah, the reason, as you as you may, I'm sorry, the reason as you may know, because if you're educated, you cannot be taken for granted. You 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 understand you understand what things are. So they yeah. don't want to educate you because they want to keep you. You know, uneducated, not knowing your rights, not knowing, you know, how what to do in life. And you cannot even write your name. You cannot even, you know, sign. Uh, if you give you a document, you cannot understand what the document says. You could be signing your life away, not yeah. knowing what you signed. So colonialism kept us uneducated for that reason. Mm -hmm.
but um, it, then you, in your generation, after independence, you were able to become educated. Yeah. So yeah. if I my my mom is illiterate, uh, you know she only speaks Berber. My father only finished primary school, and then to survive, he had to work for a different family, be a shepherd for a different family. Hmm. You know, yeah. but after independence, the, you know, the, you know, we had access to schools, universities, sent overseas to get you know better education because at that moment there was no not enough teachers. In fact, in my high school, when I was in the technical high school in a city called Delis, mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe where our teachers came from. So because mm -hmm. friends left, there mm -hmm. were no. I mean, and Algeria was building, you know, these. These 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 uh, schools. My French teacher, my French teacher was Romanian. My physics mm. teacher was Russian. My chemistry teacher was Russian. My English teacher was, was Pakistani. My mm. Arabic teacher in high school was Palestinian, and we had also French teachers who taught us uh, the labs, you know, me mechanical labs, laboratory. Uh, uh, foundry and so forth. So we had French, Russian, uh, Romanian teachers in my technical high school because Algeria needed people to, you know, they brought a lot of uh, foreigners to educate the new generation of Algerians. Right. Which is which is beautiful that they, they would reach out to the outside world to bring people to help raise their own people um, raise the level of the people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a, that. That's an investment. Yeah, in the people, you know, and it's uh, yeah, it's it was a good really investment. Yeah, you know, that's the reason you know independence did bring us really, you know, it, get uh, Algerians educated, which is the most important thing. I don't know if you know uh, about education and books. I mean, I'm I'm happy to see you have a lot of books there. I always remember. When I talk to people about books, I always tell them there is a Jewish proverb that hmm. says, "If you, if I have money, I'll buy books. If I have any left, I'll buy food." That's have a, you heard of this problem. proverb? Yeah, the, uh, I haven't heard that before, but I like it. Yeah, you know, the Jews are a people of the book. It's, yeah, yeah. It's so out. if you have the money, buy books first. Don't buy food. <laughs> I like that. I like yeah. that. Idea. You, know, you can't eat paper, but it will feed your mind. Yeah. And also, I, I, I have some uh, uh, I have some nephews and nieces in Algeria. I told them, look, once you feed your brain, whatever you put in your brain and you learn it, nobody can take away for you, from you. If I give you money, somebody can steal it. But yeah. if I give you, you put knowledge in your head, nobody can steal that away from you. It's there in your head. Yeah. You know, in just like with photos, the photos you take, capture a moment of time books you know there, there are many you know history sciences literature poetry but in the, one thing is that they all i think every book captures something about the age there's there's a book i had here about algeria and i have i have too many and i need to organize them but it was um <laughs> There's an American uh, service, an American soldier. I think he was a, a Civil War veteran. And um, he went to Algeria. Oh, I, would I would be looking around for ages for it. But um, it's a fascinating story. He was, this, he was an American soldier. He enlisted with the French. This was in the 1870s. So, 1870s. Oh, yeah. wow. And uh, so he's describing what he was seeing as an American. And just uh, some of it was just horrible tragedies because he was he was serving the French. They were consolidating their control. Or so he would describe all sorts of interesting things. Like, for example, you know, sometimes, you know, Morocco, the, uh, the French had conquered Morocco. So sometimes uh, the Amazigh from Morocco, they would ride over the border and the horses. And just shoot at the French, and then they were right back to Morocco, <laughs> you know. And and the French, they couldn't chase them because you know then they will be entering into Moroccan territory. 
uh, and other things, you know, they're, for example, they're um, Zouaves. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and um, but sometimes they would recruit them from local, and it was very tragic because, you know, the, the, the soldiers would be complicit in the occupation. So the mm -hmm. French soldiers would give the uh, the dirty work to the Algerian Zouave soldiers and tell them to do these things. So if they, you know, sometimes if there was just a petty, small crime, you know, a small farmer is, is, is doing the wrong thing, you know, they would tell them to take them out, you know, by the river to talk to them. And the soldier had a order to just, just kill the man. So he would just mm -hmm. like, you know, he would, talk to the man and you know the man turned around you know he didn't want to they wouldn't kill the man in their face they wanted to give mm. him some dignity but then they would just shoot the poor man and uh -huh. he would fall in the river and he would describe all of these things that the French because he was an American he was observing this and eventually I, th he, I think he, he got uh, disillusioned and he returned to America but he mm. these bits of history would have been lost if it wasn't for one person seeing it. And then he decides in his memoirs that he's going to write them down. That's what the nice, nice, yeah, exactly the same thing yeah. with books, books and pictures. Yeah. That yeah. information, would have, if he didn't write it down, it would be gone. I mean, you wouldn't be able to share it with me now. Exactly. Well, it, it, like your story, if you didn't write it down, it would just be one story out of millions that never got told. But now, you know, it is there and it's part of history. Yes, thank uh, you. So you uh in your book you mentioned and I don't know if it's um if it's appropriate you know to discuss political matters, you know. Um you know the, the you, you mentioned some things and, and please tell me if you and also I'll edit this before I upload it, but if it's something that you, you want to talk about or something that you don't. Um, your thoughts on the, at the time you're reflecting, like I'm, I'm reading the narrative, you're reflecting on your thoughts on the Bush administration and its relationship with, um, the administration, uh, Bouteflika. Yes. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, it, and, mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really kind of strange. You know, the relationship is, uh, between Algeria and America is built on the, uh, you know, I'm not sure what it's built on, really. It's it's good and bad, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, of course, it's built on oil, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, Algeria has to allow, in a way, American companies to go and, you know, you know discover oil and, and buy oil from Algeria. Uh, so they, in a way, they, you know, I mean, as you know, America has a lot of uh, client states, in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. To a certain to a certain point, really, you know, you cannot really they in certain areas they can exert exert pressure. In other areas, they cannot exert. When it comes to economy and so forth, they can. When it comes to political situa situation, like support to of Israel, they cannot really move the Algerian government. I mean, the Algerian government is really, for, you know, uh, rightly, you know. Uh, complaining about the plight, the plight of Palestinians, which I think is really, you know, horrible in, uh, currently. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, what, what I don't feel the, the the foreign policies of the American government. It's really not, you know, not good for America to be the the you know, destabilizing Serbia or you know Ukraine or. It's really not good in the you know because it just puts the whole world in turmoil. You know, I my goodness, it's crazy. It's not That's all I can say. Yeah, huh? it's not good for. You're right. It's not good for. It's not good for the world, but it's not good for Americans. It's not good for. Oh, yeah, Americans. It's not American. oh. I mean, a lot of people. I mean, I mean, respect. You know, a lot. Of, I mean, don't get me wrong. A lot of people respect Americans, but they don't like the foreign policy of the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's just not in the interest of the world or the American people. Right. That that I can say. That that one, this one, you can put. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Certainly. You know. Um, mm -hmm. You know. It's also I found it interesting that you know Algeria. You know the Algerian government does. Um, 
and the Algerian people, the, the people and the government, as far as the situation in, in Palestine and Gaza and Israel, it is interesting that, um, in the, you know, of course, people uh, people say uh, that Algeria is an Arab country, just like people say Morocco is an Arab country. But, you know, it's it's not just Arab, it's, it's Barbary as well. You know, yeah. I'm a yeah. Zeri, Berber, yeah. Arab. But so it's um you know, I think it's not the Maghreb al Arabi quote unquote is no, yeah. Well, yeah. it's um you know very ancient, very, very ancient uh, civilizations, Numidia, Mauritania, you know, you have the Carthaginian state there's a Venetian rich, rich history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Saint Augustine, but, you know, you, you mentioned yeah. Saint Augustine. <laughs> yeah, Saint Augustine, he's he's Algerian. Um, Have you been to uh, Anaba? No, my my wife told me so much about Anaba, and I we, I want to go someday. You know, yeah. I, 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 hopefully, we'll, maybe the next time uh, we go back and visit her family, we, we'll go to Anaba. Yeah. Yeah. That's where his cathedral is, it, which is interesting. Yes, yeah. yes, because there was a, next to it there is the Roman ruins of Hippo. Yes, people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. So you know this the layers of antiquity, the, the stories, the history, you know, it's like you see it comes back to photos. You see a picture of ruins, old stones, and that's the place now, and that you know that's recorded and captured. But then there are earlier phases, and maybe with the mind, the imagination. Someone can almost see into the past. You can yeah. try to visualize what it would have been like a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. Yeah. And also, this brings this brings me. I'm thinking about the bridge, the, the bridging, the the bridging uh, you mentioned, the bridging. So right. picture the bridge the bridge the minds between yes. the the past and the present. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's you going back to the title of your, of your uh, you know of your YouTube show, bridging the pictures, right. bridge the minds. Oh, this is how it was before. Now I can see it. So it connects you to the past. They do. I used to like to read uh, National Geographic magazines when I was a little boy, and in the li in one of the libraries I would go to, they had bound copies back to the beginning. So you know, I was born in the early early nineteen seventies. Um, and, you know, the only way I had to visualize what the world was like in the past is pictures. So I will look at these old National Geographic magazines and there are photos and pictures of, but what I found fascinating was there are photos of Algeria, photos of mm -hmm. Tunisia, photos of, of Morocco, photos of, um, Spain, photos of France and the people you know, in the 1800s, in the early 1900s, and their traditional dress in the cities before there were automobiles, but there were cameras. So the, sure, yeah. you know, the camera was invented. So at that point in history, the photographer could capture something for all time, you know, yeah. until those photos existed. And it's just interesting to see what the people were like. And you see a photo of a little child um, there's this one evocative photo of um of an Algerian. There's the woman in a, the west of Dar of a house, the courtyard, and one of the women was um like sifting grain with a, like a mm -hmm. sapphire, mm -hmm. and the, there were little girls next to her, and you know there's an, another woman who I think was a servant, and she was bringing something. And on one hand, everyone in that photo is now is now dead. Even the little children may have been dead for 80 years because mm -hmm. the, the photo was taken at the end of the 19th century. Wow. It, that, the, the little girls in that picture are forever young. You can see yeah, them right, and yeah, you exactly. always see yeah. them as they were then and the mother yeah. and everyone. And who knows if that house even exists anymore. Yeah, but Maybe not, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so 
during your interview with the FBI, you know, they ask you many questions and you mentioned in your book, there, there's this one, this moment involving UBL. And it, <laughs> so, so yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind maybe sh sharing about that. Oh yeah. So in, so very good. So I have a, uh... A long time ago, I used to buy CDs, uh, Algerian CDs, from this site called UBL, mm -hmm. Ultimate Band List. And they sent me a decal, which I put on my phone, a folder. And by, you know, by a chance or by luck, I took that with me that day. And he saw, UB, he saw the letters UBL. And he asked me, what does UBL stand for? So I don't know. It's Ultimate Band List, a website mm -hmm. on 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 the internet. I used to buy I used to buy CDs, music CDs. Well, I thought it was just his question was just very you know, normal picture. But as we came out, the lawyer said like, "Oh, you have a, a sign here. You you know uh, a sign looking for." Osama bin Laden, UBL. And that just like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. That just like, you know, it's like, oh my God, UBL is also Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. So the, so what I thought was just a simple question, he thought I was a fan of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> oh you know, have you ever watched Monty Python, the British comedy? Yeah, British, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like something so absurd it might be in a Monty Python skit. Oh, uh, I couldn't be oh my goodness. When he's when my lawyer said, Oh, you have a UBL uh, like looking uh, uh, you know how they have this sign looking for terrorist. Mm -hmm. So oh, you have been uh, they, uh what is it called now? You have a um, the first, the most wanted. List. Yeah, most wanted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you have uh, the sign for, for UBL most wanted. <gasps> UBL. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I like it. It's, it all makes sense now. It, it all, all makes sense yeah. then. It yeah. all made sense that I, he thought I was a fan of Osama bin Laden. That's <laughs> right. crazy. Which, which is, I mean, well, I can laugh about it now, but it's like, whoa. Yeah. But at the time, you know, all of this, this headache and, 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 and pain to you just because of a very, a very stupid misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah. Also, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, just because, I mean, we should not, as human beings, we should never you know, uh, I mean, even if you, if you you may think if you see somebody whose color is different, you may right. First, you know, the first moment you may think something, but mm -hmm. you know, like the instantaneous thought. But then your mind, okay, I have thought this. Let's say I see you, Kamal, with a beard, right? Right. I say, oh, Kamal is re religious, or is he Jewish? But then I say, no, maybe he's neither. My, my second thought should mm -hmm. be. He could be neither. He just likes to have a beard, right? You know. So even after you capture the appearance, yeah, you know, yeah after you yeah. capture the appearance, you know, the first thing that comes up, Kamal is has a beard. He's religious. Mm -hmm. But my second thought should be, no, you may be something else. He just likes to have a beard. Right. Maybe he cannot wish. You know, he maybe his wife told him to have to have the beard. He doesn't <laughs> like it. So we have to have the second thought should be mm -hmm. against your first thought. Yeah, that's what I think we should have. You know, if you see somebody, uh, you know, walking slowly, don't say he mm -hmm. is lazy. Maybe he has, you know, muscle problems. You know, so you mm -hmm. could not you could not make a judgment from what you see or what you first notice. You should not right. do judge the person on what you see, what you notice. Always say have a second thought. That's what we th I think we should do. Seeing you know a brown person taking pictures doesn't make him automatically a terrorist. He just likes taking pictures of beautiful things in life. That's all. Right, right. See yeah. a poor person you're walking down the street, don't see his poor person. Maybe he doesn't like, you know, to spend money on expensive clothes. It just as long as it's clean, it's good for him, you know, it's good enough for him. That's right. what I 
I think we, we human beings should should do, you know, really not act on the first impression we have whenever we see somebody. Hmm. There is a there's a, a TV show, not TV show, what am I thinking of? Radio show. I, it, it's an NPR. You know, I grew up listening to NPR. You know, some you know some I like, some I don't. Yeah, yeah. The older I get, you know, there's a there's a there's a there's a gentleman locally. His name is Nelson Slater. He's a he's he's a music artist. Uh, he used to be with uh, Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground in New York. Okay. Um, and uh, well, before the Velvet Underground, even. And you know, Nelson, uh, he likes to walk his dog down the street. And you know, I, I I've had many encounters with him. He, he's a great guy to talk to. But one day, I. I made the mistake of mentioning NPR. And he got very angry. But now it was a national propaganda. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not national public radio, it was national propaganda radio. He mentioned, you know, Cokie Roberts, which actually is funny that he mentioned these things because I, I investigated him. He's like, Cokie Roberts, who used to be on NPR, the late Cokie Roberts. She's CIA. She's, you know, she's, she's a propagandist. Her husband is a, uh, you know, it's like a um, it's like a neoliberal um, CIA asset and officer. And, and actually, you know, I I looked into it and I'm like, wait a second. You know, there is there are these connections between, you know, the government and media. So, oh, yeah. yeah, even though I grew up thinking that NPR was a very objective, you know, media source, it, it's not it's like, not, like yeah, no yeah. media. But um. I think they've tried to get a little better over the years. So there's a show on NPR. And it, you know, the, the what you mentioned reminded me of the title of the show. It's called Snap Judgment. And you oh. know, it, they they try, you know, they try to it's a newer show. They try to feature stories um sometimes about race or ethnicity or class, people who are poor, are different categories of, of life, but in which something changes. And you know that the, the, there was a a judgment, a quick judgment made that didn't fit the reality of the person. And what you what what I hear you saying is like have a second thought after the first thought. Don't make a snap judgment. You know, maybe the first thought is natural, but then make a, another judgment after having a second thought. So, so one thing I'll tell you a story. So one day I'm a member of a Toastmaster club. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know toast. I mean, I, I made so many friends there. And one time with this girl, you know, this new member came in and she spoke a little slower, you know, and I asked Rabat, she's you know, oh, she's like a little bit, you know, she has issues with the mind or something. But I said, Rabat, no, don't don't think like that. She turned out to be a, such a nice person and such yeah. educated just because she had a speech in the, in, in the treatment. Hmm. My first first thing like, oh, she has no, she wasn't. She has been treatment, but then that did not stop her from being a very good postmaster. She became president. She became yeah. a program director. She became a district director. Wow, <laughs> very interesting. So you have to have a, always. A second judgment that's opposing opposing mm -hmm. the first one. Don't let your first judgment, you know, first judgment uh, lead your life or control your life. Then like you'll be in trouble in life. <laughs> I think that's a wise. I think that's a wise way yeah. of um, of going about things. Yeah, you know, and that's. I mean, that's in this situation that you lived. You know, the the, the, the moment. The officer, you know, who knows what the officer was thinking, but maybe he didn't have a second thought. He made an assumption. And the FBI, you know, the FBI um, agents, you know, they had a first thought about something, you know, UBL, something very similar. And you explained what it, you know, when you were asked, uh, yeah. you, you, you meant, you said what it was for, but somehow that didn't enter um into their processes so it's 
if if they had had a second thought, if multiple people had had a second thought, you would have been spared a lot of headache. Yeah, quite a different. Yeah, or you just a guy with a hobby. Like, yeah. Sometimes I wonder how did the the police report because the, the the police report took, you know, the the report from the state trooper, Illinois state trooper, mm -hmm. took three months to go through the, all the you know bureaucracy to end yeah. up in Bloomington. It went through the Amtrak. I think he, the guy. The officer report get to the Amtrak, the Amtrak to the FBI in Chicago, the FBI to Chicago with the FBI in Bloomington. That's how they called me. So it's like, what the problem? My name is all over now. Right. Famous in the wrong way. Famous in the wrong way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I, I'm I'm curious. So after this experience, you know, um, how long was it? How long did it take for your life to return to normal? And um, how did you go back into your hobby? Well, I, I think uh, first, you know, uh, I, after three months, I started to write my story. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, then it took like almost, so it, uh, it took at least a a year almost to write the story, have it edited by people. First time I just wrote a small article and mm -hmm. then I gave it to a magazine and, and they want to make a lot of changes. Oh, yeah. Change this, change that, change that. So I decide, well, let me see if I can it, you know, if I can write more, I don't want to change anything. Mm -hmm. So that, then I made it as a as a small as, as a short book. I think so. I, for a while, I was involved. You know, I was involved with with that. So it gave me a way to really deal with the emotions. Mm -hmm. I, but I would say to uh, uh, at least two or three years before I started, you know, to really deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, deal. I accepted it happened with behind. Once the book was published, mm -hmm. then it's like behind me. Oh, mm -hmm. and since my 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 hobby for photography or my love photography didn't die really. It just right. put in hibernation. <laughs> right. The, the little experience, you know, the little interrogation or interview with the FBI puts the my love photography into hibernation. But then it popped up, and they've been taking pictures since then with no problem. Uh, I take pictures in Algeria. I walk when I go to Algeria. I I walk like 10, 15 kilometers a day. You know, oh. taking pictures all over Algiers right. without any problem. You know, people ask me, you know, without even, I, I take pictures not even thinking. Hey, mm. in fact, one time I was stopped by the policeman. He says, we're taking pictures. I said, well, as long as it's not military, it's okay. Then I talked to the policeman oh. and he invited me to his wedding. <laughs> so once you talk to the police, <laughs> so That's it's funny. really, yeah. But I mean, photography has to, has, has to be, you know, uh, is 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 in me, so I still continue to take pictures, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But it took a while. So once the book was published, I would say then it became okay to take pictures. The book let me put the experience behind me. Right. So, so in two thousand five, when it was published, then it was you know then I could I could take pictures. Although I just sometimes I just uh, you know make sure. You know, I, I openly, not like, not say, don't do it like surreptitiously. I like, hey, here's my camera. Right. Which, yeah. you know, maybe that the, the openness yeah. uh, is attractive to people. It, it, it opens their hearts, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but so it sounds uh, from listening to you as if maybe the process of writing uh, about your experience helped purge a lot of, um, or maybe helped heal or, or yeah. things. Yeah, it, it did remove because for for until I started to write, the pain was really in my heart. Like as I mentioned, how could I be not inhuman? Yeah, how could I be inhuman uh, when I take pictures of spiders? Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, I I don't even I, I don't step on on ants. I don't step on insects when I walk. And then to see the FBI think I am a terrorist, which means I am able to kill Crazy. indiscriminately people, that just blows my mind. I cannot do that. So, uh, you know, having written that and 
removing the pain. Yeah, I'm, so in a way, the book let me tell my story. At the same time, I'm proving that I'm human. Yes. You know, yeah. I think that sometimes that is a common experience, you know, for people who are marginalized, not just brown and black people. You know, this also be, you know, white people who are poor or are from marginal backgrounds, you know, are people who are, you know, from, um, you know, who, who are who don't fit into the dominant societal narrative. Sometimes there is this feeling of a need to prove your humanity, that, that, that I am human, that I am yeah. a person, not an object. Exactly, yeah. So that's, you know, by proving my humanity, Okay, yes, I'm a human with my book now. I just said it. I just proved it. <laughs> yes, it's, it's right here. Yeah, I can take pictures, yeah. Yeah, with beautiful pictures in it. Thank you. Yes, I mean, absolutely. You know, and, yeah, and it's, it's beautifully written. Um, it, it's very fluid. Um, I, and I think people who like memoirs should like reading it. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I really think... I should. You know, it is interesting about you know your your experiences taking photos in Algeria. I um I noticed that a after the uh, with the with the new government in Algeria after Bouteflika stepped down, before yes you know I would you know there's the dark and the short uh, and I'm you know very naive American taking pictures. You know once you know. At a at, you know the train station, the Aga, you know the, the guard came up to me, and I didn't understand. My wife said, "Stop it!" But now, you know, I, I noticed that you know now uh, I've been back twice okay. uh, since the government's changed, um, since the protests, and everyone seems more relaxed. The police seem more relaxed. The military seems more relaxed, and that it, it feels like it feels like a very positive change is continuing to happen you know in in algeria that, that that's the impression i got yeah uh, i mean of, of course during the, uh, i mean during the uh, the Bouteflika, there was uh, i mean i don't know if you remember i mentioned uh, one time i was trying to take a picture of a wall with the unrest in uh, in one of the villages mm -hmm. and uh, you know yeah and also another time when i was taking a picture and be, behind me there was a bank. <laughs> I mm -hmm. mentioned that also it was a night when I was in Algeria. Uh, yeah, I, uh, in Al recently for the last two years after COVID, I haven't had any issue going around taking pictures in Algeria. Well, mm -hmm. although some of my colleagues, you know, it's like, oh, you cannot take pictures. I said, look, I've been taking pictures in Algeria all over. Uh, I mean, I. Anywhere I have been, I take pictures. Setif, Annaba, you know, Constantine, uh, where else? The Tipaza. I have taken, nobody has, has stopped taking pictures. As long as you take pictures of the military, uh, uh, you know, right. installations. Uh, the, at, at the port, uh, you know, there's like a port of Algiers where you have ships. I've taken pictures there. I, I even went there with the. Yeah, even there were with the fishermen. I walk in the fishermen area. I don't know if you know where they, they sell the fish. In I uh, looked, it, it, so when you're standing above, and yeah. you look down, it, yes. it's down there. I, yeah, I, I yeah. can smell the fish, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I've never gone down in there. I, I, oh, we should I'm go down and buy some fish from there. I we should. Fish yeah. and shrimp and all kinds of fish. And even you can even walk to the port with the fishermen. And nobody will say anything to you and take pictures, yeah, without any issue. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That, that's great. No. Yeah. The only I, thing that's not allowed in Algeria is drones. Uh, which you know, it makes sense. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. So if you take a drone, you. I mean, you can't get a drone, but you have to get a okay from the for the Ministry of Defense. Uh, which <laughs> you have to get an authorization. <laughs> Why bother? You know that, yeah, yeah, exactly. that sounds like a lot of bureaucracy, and you know, why bother? But uh, you know, it's, things do change. Maybe it's stories. Also, I think stories that help situations change. They help. Um, you know, they help the world. 
maybe progress. So, so yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much of your, of your more of, of, of your time. It's been wonderful, wonderful talking with you and wonderful uh, getting to know you. Um, it's, um, for people who are interested, um, where can, where can people see some of your writing? You mentioned you've been published in some magazines and also some of your photos. If someone wanted to, um, sure. discover more. So there is the website, www.zeranaim.com. There is a website, there is a list of all the articles in French or English that I've written in the past. Uh, also, uh, the book is available on Amazon. Right. It's available, you can buy a used one or a new one. It, you know, you have a choice. It's, right. it's also available available in Algeria at the airport, just like where you uh, did your wife buy it at the airport or at the... You know, I miss an I for some reason I thought that she bought it in Blida because you know she 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 likes she'll go to bookstores to see if there's something that's interesting for me when she's in the country, which you know I I adore her, she's wonderful, um and she mentioned that she was, uh that that she was looking Blida, but when I asked her, she actually bought this in the airport, so, at the yeah, airport. Okay. Yeah, for some reason I thought that she bought it in Blida, but she actually bought this at at the airport. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been selling the the book. I mean, I take them from here, and mm -hmm. I put them at different air, at the different my uh, bookstores at the airport downtown in Algiers. Okay. Uh, also, yeah, at least three or four, uh, three or four bookstores in Algiers. One in Tizi was two or three in Tizi was due, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that's all the the cities where there is. At the airport is where people. I've been buying the most and in Algiers also. And it's very cheap in Algerian dinars, you know? Yeah. It, even cost, it doesn't cost $10 in Algeria. Right. Yeah, no, so, people, um, so for Algerians, it's best if they buy it in Algeria. It's cheaper. Go to Algiers. Buy the, even go to for Algeria, Nana, you know, go there, explore, discover the place, and buy the book in the airport. Yeah. And also, the, my, my website has the list of uh, the bookstore where it's being sold. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. And, and you live in Bloomington, uh, Illinois. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So I'm uh, I'm now retired from uh, from my employer, so I have free time to go travel, write, and take more pictures. Which is uh, maybe that's what life is about, you know. I mean, you work the first few years, then you can relax and do what you like. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Well. well I, I really had a wonderful time talking with you and thank you so much for sharing your story and um, sharing more things you know and I would love to you know continue to converse and and stay in touch no problem I don't mention also that the the book when it came out was used uh, uh, in the uh, uh, three new, three different universities used it as a reading material which is yeah. that's that's it is a fascinating story. So that is um the University of Nebraska and Lincoln mm -hmm. used it in the uh, in the uh, history department hmm. at the Bloomington, uh, Indiana was in the hmm. uh, anthropology, I think. Okay. And also here in Bloomington, Illinois in the French uh, the French department they read my book. <laughs> Why not? You know, the in university at the University of Cincinnati, there's um there's a professor, Dr. Frierson. And you know, her especially is the, the MENA region. Um oh. and other things. And I'm you know, I I've, I've had friends who one one of my friends was her she was his PhD advisor. I think my, my youngest brother took classes with her. I think there's a lot of people who have and you know, I'll I'll mention the book. You know, I'll send an email to Dr. Frierson and you know just mention it because it i think it's yeah it would be something that i think is very appropriate Thank for you. students uh, and a wide variety of disciplines for sure so all right well well thank you thank you so much for well, thank for, you for the opportunity i really enjoyed uh, talking with you i also learned a few things about your trips and uh, uh 
I wish you would look in bringing. I, I do like the bringing of minds, which Thank photography you. and writing does. You know, just yeah, imagine you. today if we are able to read the books by Plato. You know, mm. Pla Plato, Plato, right? Yeah. You know, it's like bridging the mind between two or three thousand years ago to today. So books it and is. yes, so it's very yeah. interesting. To the bridging of mind is the most important between cultures, between people from different cultures, from different background is very very important. That's how we can mm -hmm. create more, you know, comprehensive, more uh, there's another word, uh, cohesive society in this world. If we don't bridge our minds, we'll be in trouble. <laughs> And maybe that's um, one reason why there are so many problems around the world, that there isn't enough bridging of minds, not making connections. But, you know, yeah, you can read a book from 2,000 years ago and you're, you're, you're bridged, you cross over a bridge to the reality of that person. And now with over a century, well over a century uh, of photography, no, no it's almost as we yeah, yeah. yeah from, from old glass plates to now digital cameras, we have a bridging of, you know, so many small still moments, like, like the title of your book, Still Moments, Yeah, bridged across decades and even a century. If I could ask a technical question, I, I'm curious. Sure. Um, do you still... Uh, shoot film or do you shoot digital now or, or do you do both i uh, i still have my f1 canon f1 new camera i haven't shot the film yet but in fact uh i, I should i shoot digital mm -hmm. uh, but recently i went to spain mm -hmm. and i saw people buying film really and i saw even black and white film which was my favorite wow yeah, the Il4, the Il4, mm -hmm. and the, the Il4, uh, Il4, Il4 is the brand, is the brand name. And I, so I, just because of that, I went to the store and I asked the store, you know, the store owner, are people buying film? And he said, yes, the New York people are buying film. That's, that's wonderful. So maybe there will yeah. be a renaissance of film someday soon. Of film. In fact, that's like, Rabba, maybe it's time you should start thinking your, your film camera out <laughs> why not yeah why yeah. not you still have it so it's, it's i still there. have it i still have the you know the lenses and everything yeah yeah it's uh you know even uh even like um instant you know instant photos i know there's been a well, now it's now it's coming back yeah, yeah. Well, it's coming back yeah I, th I think maybe with, you know, I think maybe with a new generation, it's like how vinyl records are coming mm -hmm. back. You know, the, the younger people are rediscovering it. And, you know, I was looking around in Algiers for, um, you know, some uh, Algerian discs. And, you know, I, I couldn't find any, but I would, some, you know, when I, the next time I go back, so I, I, bought, I just bought a record turntable again for the first time in in ages uh, a couple of years ago you know kept me company during the, the covid mm -hmm. so you know I, I thought okay I'll look for some chef mammy some chef oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this uh, you know just just and j maybe just find you know old things I, I like discovering things I didn't know about. If you cannot find them in Algeria, uh, maybe in France. That's a good idea. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, because they could be, you know, they, they, you could easily find uh, store, you know, uh, vinyl disc, uh, vinyl stores in France more than in Algeria. Hmm. I will look. I, I will look yeah. the next time I'm, I'm in France. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Just like you know, whenever I travel in France, I go to the old bookstore, used bookstores, because mm -hmm. that's where you find the old books, you know. And the old books have they're special. There's something, you know. They, first, there's the history of a book. The other, you know, these uh, this uh, the stack of books next to me, these are all old books, but they're from a library. I need to return them. But there's a library in downtown Cincinnati called the Mercantile Library, mm -hmm. and it's the oldest library, the oldest library still around in 
in uh, Cincinnati. And it's, uh, you know, these, this book is 96 years old. And um, there's some amazing books about Algeria there too. Uh, just old, like from the 1800s. Sometimes the, the, the spines are crumbling and not many people check the books out anymore. So it's a membership library. But, um, you know, you're, you're, if, you have a, if you get a hold of an old book, it's something that other hands have touched. There's a bridging, you know, people in the house. And the, yeah. And also, you know, books get edited, they get modified. You know, if you have something that's from the past, you have a more authentic record. Yeah. So, yeah. I, 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 next time I'm in France, I'll definitely go look for, you know, definitely. Well, 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 thank you so much. It's been a thank you, Kamal. Okay. I really appreciate your interest, and uh, we'll keep in touch. And uh, if you have any more questions, okay. just shoot you know, shoot me and you know shoot me an email, and we can discuss them. And I know that I'm delighted. I will be delighted thank to. You.